Okay, so we've been talking about uh, binary BCS codes. Okay, and uh, we saw a whole bunch of properties. We saw the parity check matrix construction. Then we saw encoding. Okay, so from here we went to the generator matrix, right? So that was quite important. Then we saw encoding, in particular we saw systematic encoding, we saw came up with a very simple way of doing systematic encoding. Then what else did we see? Finally we saw decoding. Okay, so, so one thing uh, that comes out from all of this is that both these can be implemented in pra with practical constraints. Okay, so these are very much implementable codes, can be implemented. Hopefully, I've convinced you of that. The algorithm is not too hard. In today's VLSA, it's quite easy to do it. You can just follow the algorithm and uh, implement both. Okay. So, what I'm going to point out today is, uh, is some important uh, remarks connecting this binary PCH codes to other kind of codes called cyclic codes. It's uh, so one thing I should say is what I defined as binary BCH code is actually not rigorously not a binary BCH code. It's it's, it's a shortened version of it. Okay. But this is good enough for, for practical reasons. I'll, I'll come back and I'll fix that and I'll tell you what the actual binary BCH code is. What the code that we saw is very closely related to it, but it's not exactly that. So, we will see that. Okay. So, so, before we proceed to that, I want to point out about something called erasures. Erasures and errors decoding. Okay. So, this will importance that particularly uh, going towards uh, future future decoding algorithms, it's uh, much more complex than what we have today, you have to first understand erasures. Okay? So erasures are an important step in the middle. So the idea of erasures is the following. Okay, So you have, you, so you typically when you have an encoder, you have a message M which gets encoded into a third word C. Okay? So what I wrote down in our model so far is that C to C, you add an error vector which is binary and you get R. Okay? So actually in a practical communication system, that's not what will happen. Okay? Something more crazy will happen. So one more level of sophistication is to say that the C gets converted into some modulation alphabet, then that goes through a noisy channel, say additive yeah, Gaussian noise or something, and then you decode that. Okay? So that's a slightly more uh, sophisticated way of viewing the communication channel. So actually the receiver, okay, the receiver, on the receiver side, will not only get bits 0 or 1, it will actually get some some more information quite often about the bit. Okay? So what you can do at a very, very uh, simple level is that the receiver will receive three possible things. Okay? It will either receive 0 or 1 or some additional symbol which we will call an erasure. Okay? So what does that symbol represent? It represents the fact that the receiver is, has really, is not really sure whether what was received was 0 or 1. Okay, so it's very very uncertain. So it simply erases that and puts an e there and conveys to the rest of the de to the decoder that I really don't know what I received in this position. It could be a zero, it could be a one, but so I'll call it erased. Okay, so if you can use this information, you use this information and improve your decoder. Okay, so that's the idea and the binary erasure. Okay, so that's that's called uh, erasures and error model. So erasures plus errors. Okay. On the receiver side, you will receive a vector R. Okay. All right. So, so the way to model this R is basically R is now not a binary vector. It's not 0, 1 anymore. Okay. It can have three different values. Okay. So, R is say R1, R2, Rn. Ri takes three different values. It could be 0, it could be 1, or it could be an erasure. Okay. So, several things can happen here. Okay. So, if you are transmitting a 0, the noise could have been very negligible that you got 0 itself. Okay? If you transmit a 0, noise could have been so strong that you got a 1. Okay? So, you transmit a zero, 0 and then you get some medium noise, which is neither very strong or not very weak, so that the receiver can somehow figure out that I am really confused. I do not know if this is a 0 or a 1. At that point, it will output this E, which I call as an evasion. Okay? So, if you want a uh, distinguishing from E and the error vector, maybe we will call this epsilon. Okay, so it's a, so it's a, okay. Epsilon is a symbol that denotes that the receiver is totally confused. Okay. So the decoder will receive 
R1 through Rn and each Ri is either 0, 1 or epsilon. Okay. And there is a mapping between how 0, 1 goes to this. Remember, here the score word belongs to 0, 1 n. Okay. So how does this happen? There is a probabilistic thing here. If the input is 0 or 1, the output could be 0 with probability, let's say, we let us put some probability here. So let's say 1 minus p minus e. Okay. And the probability e, it can go into this erasure mode. Okay, epsilon the probability E and the probability P it can become 1. Okay, so that's the model here. So likewise I'll have a symmetric thing for 1, the probability 1 minus P minus E it will remain as 1, the probability E it will become this epsilon erasure and the probability P it will become C. Okay, so this is my error errors and erasures model. Okay. That's the idea. Okay. So this goes called the erasure. Okay. All right. So now the question is, how can the decoder use this information? Okay. So that's the idea. That's the uh, that's the point of it. Right. So the decoder should be able to use this information. If the decoder can't use this information, then it's useless. But if it, it, it should be able to use. It, okay. So the location of the erasure is kind of a hint to the decoder. It knows that in those places things are bad. Okay. So let's let's first uh, come up with some general theory. If there is no erasure, if the probability of erasure is zero, if there is no erasure, then we know if d min is the minimum distance in flux, uh, the p errors can be corrected. P such that two t plus one less than or equal to d errors can be corrected. Right? This we know. Right? If a minimum distance is d, the code can correct 2d plus 1 erasure. So this is under no erasure model. Okay, no erasures. Okay. If there are erasures, it turns out if there are let's say uh, let me not use p here, if there are uh, u what, 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 what shall we call it? So let's say u errors and v erasures. Okay, writing errors again. U errors and V errors are correctable whenever whenever two times U plus V plus one is less than or equal to. Okay, so this is the erasure plus error mark. Okay, so how did we picture this? So, so we saw this big little uh, space here which had all the code words and we said any two code words are separated at least by a distance d, distance is greater than or equal to d. So if you make t errors and 2d plus 1 is smaller than d, you will always be closest to the code word that you transmitted. So the decoder what should you do? You should do this nearest neighbor decoder. So you find the code word that is closest to you and then you decide that that is the that, that is the transmitted code word that will always correct the errors. Okay. So now you have a problem where you have u errors and v erasures. Okay. And I am claiming there is a decoder for a code with minimum distance d which can always correct u errors and v erasures as long as 2u plus v plus 1 is less than or equal to d. Is that clear? So that is that's the meaning of the statement. I can quite put it that way. So the, the nearest neighbor decoder, the maximum likelihood decoder can correct t errors as long as 2t plus 1 is less than or equal to d. That's, that's something that we know already. Okay, now I have a situation where there are some errors and there are some erasures. Okay, of course I don't know where the errors are. I know where the erasures are. So what's the problem with the erasures? I don't know if it was 0 or 1. Okay, so that's the problem. I am claiming that if in a received block somebody tells you that there were u errors and v erasures, you can always correct it by designing a suitable decoder. How will I do it? Any ideas? How can I go about doing this? Mm, ok, 
Okay, so okay, so I mean, I I don't want a, I don't want a decoder explicitly. I just want some ideas on how to approach this problem. I mean, if you think there is some see. So for instance, we didn't have an explicit decoder for the two T plus one also. We just said there exists a decoder. All you have to do is go to the nearest code word. Right? And it's not very implementable. It's some big maximum likelihood decoder. Okay. But now I have arrays, arrays as well as erasures, so I can't define distance and all, right? So from erasure, how do I do distance? I can't do distance easily. So that's the question. Hmm. If you convert an erasure to an error, some some crazy things can happen. Look at this condition. In this condition, if u is zero, suppose u is zero, we can go as much as d minus one. So if I keep converting errors to zero and one, I might go closer to other code words. I might get many many versions giving me the correct answer, right? So I may not be able to control it that way. Okay. 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 So that's the idea. So that's important. So what you do is you simply drop the bits that were erased from your code. So what is that operation called? It's puncturing. Okay. So you puncture your code. At the positions of the erasures, you know the position of the erasures, right? So you puncture your code in those positions. Okay. Now for the punctured code, what is the minimum distance? D minus v. Okay. And I have u errors in the punctured code. As long as 2u plus 1 is less than or equal to d minus v, I can correct the u errors. Okay. So you go to the punctured code, dropping the erased positions, do a maximum likelihood decoding, correct your u errors, and then what will you do? You're still not done, right? What will you do next? Okay, so that's the first step. The first step is clear, right? What do you do next? Okay, how do you know that there will be only one code word? There can be more than one code word. So she she is saying, okay, so 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 I've gotten rid of errors in the non-erased part. There are no errors on that side, right? This is the procedure I told you. We get rid of that, right? Go to the punctured code. Correct the U errors. The U is gone. Okay. Now she is saying for the erased part, you try every single possibility and see whether you get a code word. My point is, how do you know that you get only one code word? The answer is correct. You get only one code word. How do you know? Yeah, exactly. So, so because you have two U plus V plus one is less than or equal to D, you can show that if there are two different code words that are that differ inside only that V, the minimum distance will be lesser than D. So you think about how you might want to show that. It's not very hard to show that. Okay. So after you get rid of the U, U also, you will have you will have to have that. Okay. Another way to think about it is, okay. So V V is definitely less than or equal to D minus one, right? Okay. Right. V is less than or equal to D minus one. So so you know those places, and if you go to the parity check matrix, right? So you can solve for the missing positions. I'll show you how to solve for the missing positions. Okay. So so okay. So let me prove this statement in two ways. First step is what? Puncture C, puncture the code to remove V erased positions, erased uh, the positions, right? Okay. The minimum distance of puncture code is what? Minimum distance of puncture code is greater than or equal to. D minus V. Okay. Since two U plus one is smaller than or equal to D minus V, U errors can be corrected in the punctured part. Clear? Okay. okay. So U errors can be corrected in the punctured part. Now you are, you are, the only problem is figuring out the Erased part, and I'll show you some uh, so two different ways of doing it. The second second step is to correct the erasures. I'll show you a very simple way of doing it. The other way is to exhaustively try everything and argue that there'll be only one. I'll argue that there'll be only one in another way. Okay. So you take the parity check matrix for the overall code. Okay. It has several columns. Okay. So convenience, I'll list the v erased columns in the first position. Can be in any position, and list it in the first position. Let's say the first v columns are erased. Okay. So these are the erased part. So H1, H2, H2. What do you know about this? This is definitely less than or equal to D minus one. Okay. And then it'll have other columns. Okay. What do you know about H times? Uh, so remember this part. I've corrected errors. 
are already corrected. Okay. So here, instead of this mu unknown parts, let me put some variables x1, x2 through x mu. So h times x1, x2 through x mu and the remaining part I know should be equal to what? Should be equal to 0. Right? So that is a valid code word or it should be equal to 0. So that gives me a set of equations in the unknown variables. Right? The corrected part I will multiply this guy. So I will get one right hand side. So I can get an ax equals b. The only thing I have to argue is a has full column rank. How do you know that A has full column rank? In S less than A to D minus 1. So obviously it has full column rank. So it will have a unique solution. I can solve it. It is just as good as solving a linear equation. So it is very easy. Okay, you do not have to exhaustively try all two from your case. Just solve the linear equation. It is a fixed complexity for it. You will get points. Is that clear? Did you see what I did? Okay, so if you want, so let us say the corrected places are C mu plus 1 hat. So on to C n hat. Okay. So for unknown ones, I will call it x1, x2 through x2. Okay. What do I know for sure? I know that h times x1 through x mu, c mu plus 1 hat, all the way down to c n hat, should be equal to what? Should be equal to 0. Okay. So what do I do? I split this in terms of two parts. Okay. So let me call this first sub mu. Remember, these are columns. Okay. So what I call this h1 to h mu are all columns. Okay. So this sub matrix. Let me call it some A. Okay. So what, what I can do is I can split this multiplication as A times x1 through x mu equals what? The remaining part of H multiplied by C mu plus 1 through C n hat. I know all those bits. So it is some vector. So let's say some I don't know, some vector. So let's say A1, A2, all the way to A. Right? A n minus two. So some vector. Okay, so you give you you know this vector. Okay, you know this. Okay, these are unknown to you. Okay, when can you uniquely solve it? When the column rank of A equals mu. The column rank of A equals mu, you can uniquely have a solution for this. You can have only one solution, you cannot change it. So, for any A13, A n minus k, you will have a unique solution as long as the column rank here is equal to mu. Okay, so how do you know that the column rank of A is equal to mu? That comes from the minimum distance. Mu is less than or equal to t minus 1. So clearly column rank of A equals Okay, so let's try that. Mu or V, right? So saying V and V became mu. Looks like that. Is that okay? So that's the idea in, in claiming that as long as you have U errors and V erasures, so U plus V plus 1 is less than or equal to D, they can be correct. Okay, so this is the idea. All right. So this is independent of DCH codes or anything. It is a more generic idea, but there is a there is an important idea here. Okay, the idea that is crucial here is by by giving your receiver more information than just zero or one. Okay, you can do something more. Okay, you can do something more. Clearly, you can do something more here. Right? So for instance, if u is zero, you can correct up to d minus one errors, assuming that you know where the errors occur. Okay, so if you give your receiver more information about what happened to each bit on the channel, you can do something more. Okay, so that is an important idea which is exploited in today's communication systems. Okay, in today's communication systems, for each transmitted bit 0, we will at least give 6 or 7 bits to the receiver. Okay, so it is not just 0, 1 and epsilon, it is 6 or 7 bits of what is called soft information. Okay, so we will do a very granular detail. Okay, so we will say, Zero can be received in any of these form, forms. So you just you just basically provide much more granularity to your received value, okay? and that will can be very much used by the receiver, and you can really get very good performance. Okay, so this is just like a baby step towards that. But anyway, so this this principle is used very much in today's communication. So if you're doing the next course, you'll see how that is really exploited. Okay, so if you give more information to the decoder on every bit then it is much more useful for the uh, for decode. Okay? So let us come back to BCH codes. So suppose I say in a BCH code, okay, I am decoding BCH code, I know how to correct up to T errors as long as 2T plus 1 is less than equal to D, I can do that. I have a very efficient algorithm for it. Now suppose I say I want to use the decoder, but now I have U errors and V erasures. Okay? I want to use the bounded distance decoder, I do not want to do maximum likelihood decoding with the puncture code and all that. I do not want to do any of that stuff. I want to do, I want to use the bounded distance BCH decoder because I know it is very easy to do. Right? Otherwise it becomes complicated. Okay? So the question now is, 
how do we implement errors and erasures decoding in DCS codes? In the bounded distance decoder of a DCS code, in the algebraic decoder that we had, how do you interpret? Okay, so that's the idea. So let me talk about that briefly. So in DCS decoding, okay, suppose you have U errors and V erasures. And let's say 2 root plus p plus 1 is less than or equal to d. Okay. So how to adapt the algebraic boundary distance decoder? Okay, so that's the question I want to put to you. Okay, any ideas? How can I do this? Will you do it? That's where the problem comes. Right? You can't drop. Right? How do you compute the syndromes? You can't compute syndromes if you drop. I'm not dropping. See, be very careful when I say drop. I'm puncturing. You know, I'm not making it zero. So it's, it's a completely different thing. So yeah, you have to answer. How do you compute syndromes? That's what I'm asking. See, in the previous case, it correctly sidestepped it. I said you puncture those positions, you go to a punctured code and do maximum likely decoding for the punctured code. The same thing you can do here, except that it's only theoretical. You can't implement it, right? So you're not going to be able to do any easy decoding with the punctured code. You will do maximum likely decoding. The same method works here, it's no problem. Yeah, I think we're able to say R of beta is an R of beta because, because we knew what R was and we could just substitute it. But here we do, we have R itself has. Yes, that is exactly the problem I am posing to you. So here you have some gaps in the R. What do you do when you don't have the received values? How do you still do in the first step? We can the syndrome, you can't do it. Right? Without the syndrome, you can't do the algebraic decoding. So that's my question to you. How will you do it? There is a very smart and slick method which will get over that. Okay? That's why I am presenting it to you. So you see, it's a very slick method. So when I describe it, you will see that it's a very clever method. It's not a very fundamental or conceptual method. It's just a clever method. So what is the clever method? Okay, so I will give you the first step. The first step is to rewrite this in this form. U plus B by 2 is less than or equal to T, which is T minus 1. Let's say D is odd, so that T is even odd. That's the first step. So U plus B by 2, I know, is less than or equal to the error correcting capability of my code. So can you use this now to come up with a clever idea? What can I do to the erasure? Suppose I don't know the erasure. What's the first thing that you are always suggesting? Or what do you try? You have to try? Try some values for the goal. What can we try? Let's just give me one simple thing that you can put the ratios to to try. Start off with all zero. Okay, let's say I try all zero. Okay, right? U plus V by two is less than or equal to T. I know that. Okay, so V by two is less than or equal to T. Okay, I tried all zero. Let's say I, something happened. Then is there anything else I can try? All one. Okay, so in fact that is enough. Okay, so you put erase position equal to all zero. You do one decoder. Then you put erase position equals all one, you do another decoder. It turns out at the output of these two decoding, you can combine the output of decoding, these two decoding smartly to get the actual decoder as long as u plus v by 2 is less than or equal to t. Okay? So you put, you think about why that works. So it's not very hard, it's just a clever method. So what you do is you put here's the method, you put erase plus erase bits equals 0 and do bounded distance decoding, do the algebraic decoding. Okay, now once you put it is equal to 0, you can do the decoding, right? So it's just a question of computing the syndrome and running the decoding. Okay, do algebraic decoding. Okay, and then what we do? Next step is, do the first step. Second step is, you put erase bits equals 1, all of them equal to 1. And then again repeat the algebraic decoding. Okay, so you might say that both can succeed. It turns out both will not succeed. Okay, only one will succeed. Whatever succeeds can be the output of the decoder. Okay, so you can think about why it is true. It's a very slick little idea. You will see that if one succeeds, it means what? One succeeds, the other will definitely fail. Yeah, other will definitely fail because the number of errors within that would exceed the exceed t. Okay. Right? Because v by 2, if you put all 0, 
v by 2 has to be, I mean, v by 2 controls it very nicely. See, if you put all 0, the actual error vector there would have some weight. That weight is either less than v by 2 or greater than v by 2, it can be both. Okay. So, if it is less than v by 2, then when you put all 1s, the number of errors will become greater than v by 2. Okay. So, that is the way you control it. Okay. So, if you have to prove it, I am not going to prove it, but this is the idea. Okay. So, let us try to remember it. No, no, no. So, no, 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 no. Okay, so, let me, let me repeat what I am saying. Okay. So, when you put all erase bits equal to 0, how many errors will actually be there in the new, in the new received word? Okay. The received word, some portions were erased. You put all of them are 0. How many errors will there be in the new received word? It will be u plus what? 8 of the error vector in that part. Okay. When you put all 1s, what will it be? It will be u plus d minus weight of the error vector in that part. One of these two things has to be smaller than v by 2. The other would be definitely greater than v by 2. Okay. So, it will work out there. Okay. So, if both succeed, then you have a problem. Both succeed, what happens? You pick the one with the lower number of errors. So, okay. you do that. Is that okay? If either one succeeds, you pick one. Depending on if v is high enough, then only either one will succeed. If v is very, very low, v is 0 for instance, and u is less than t, then both will succeed, both may not succeed. Right? So, you have, to, you have to think about what will happen, v is very small, yeah, v is 0, both will succeed, right. So, both, both succeed, then you have to pick the one that gave you the lower number of errors. Okay, if both give you the same code work, then both, both are fine, it is no problem. Is that okay? That will be the correct answer. Okay, so you just combine the output of these two decoders in a smart way, to get the answer. Is that okay? You can prove that it works. Alright, so that is about uh, BCH decoding with uh, errors. And now we are going to move to the part that I was talking about. This is the second course part. Okay. So, like I, like I said, the codes that I defined for you are not really binary BCH codes. They are shortened version, versions of the binary BCH codes. The actual binary BCH codes uh, fall under this class of what I call cyclic codes. And I will tell you what they are. Okay. So, so, so first let us look at a special kind of BCH codes. Let us look at BCH codes okay, for which uh, n equals to order of theta. Okay, so this is the special condition that I am going to import. Okay, so so far, what did we want order of beta to be greater than or equal to n? So, so now I am going to say I want it to be equal to n. Okay, so of course now n has to be odd. Okay, so if I am going to look at if I am going to want if I am going to want beta to be in zero to power n, n has to be odd. Only then it will work. Okay, so if n is even. There is no way order of any element in g of 2 power m is going to be even. Okay. Why, why can it be even? It has to. So, the order of any element has to divide something. What choice does it have to divide? 2 power m minus 1. So, clearly an even number is not going to divide 2 power m minus 1. So, there is no way order can be even. So, n will have to be odd. Okay. So, let us pick n odd and then we will ask for n beta such that n equals order of beta. Okay. Then, there is a very, very curious property that is satisfied by the code words of the code. Okay. So, let us go back to the Parity Check Matrix. What is our Parity Check Matrix? 1 beta beta square all the way to beta power n minus 1. 1 beta square beta square 4 all the way to beta square. Let's go back. Then, all the way down to 1 beta power 2 d. So, I am going to take d equals 2 d plus 1 all of the standard. Okay. So, this is the parity set matrix. Suppose I tell you C, which is let us say C0, C1, C2, all the way down to Cn minus 1, belongs to the code. What does it mean? H times C transpose equals 0. Okay. This implies, and it implies die for instance, that a cyclic shift of C, what is a cyclic shift of C? I move it to the right and then bring the last one back. The cyclic shift C n minus 1, C 0, C 1, C n minus 2 is also in the okay. So, why is that true? Well, it is not question of swapping. How will I show that if C belongs, the C 0, C n minus 1 is in the code? The cyclic shift is also in the code. What is the way to show a code, code word belongs to the code, a vector belongs to the code? You have to check h times c transpose is 0. 
So what will be the difference between the H times C transpose? So let me call this uh, C prime. Okay. What will be the H times difference between the H times C prime transpose and H times C transpose? You take the H times C transpose, you multiply by beta. What will you get? Okay. Look at the first equation. One plus. So look at the first equation multiplied by beta. Okay. What is the first equation? One b one C zero plus beta times C one. Plus theta square c2 plus beta power n minus 1 c n minus 1 equals 0. You multiply by beta, what will you get? Yeah, so it will become, it will, it will give you this the equation corresponding to the first first equation corresponding to the second vector. Okay, and that is also 0. What will I do to the second one? Beta multiply by beta square. We will get the second equation. Likewise, I can check that everything is satisfied. What about the reverse direction? The reverse direction is very trivial to show. In fact, you take this guy and shift it right enough number of times, you will get the other way. Right? You take C prime, you shift right by 1, 2, 3, you do it n minus 1 times, you will get back to C. So, what I did once, I can do again and again and again. Once I show one cyclic shift is there, in cyclic shift twice, it will again be there. So, take this way, keep on doing it. I do it enough number of times, I will get back to that. So, obviously, it is also implied in the other way. You can also show the other implication more easily. But for now, this is one, one way of looking at it. Okay? So, such codes, codes for which you take a code word and do a cyclic shift. You again get another code word are called cyclic. Okay. Linear codes. You have to be linear, but also you can think of non-linear cyclic codes, but usually nobody thinks about it. So linear codes where a cyclic right shift, I can say right shift without any ambiguity because left shift is any number of right shifts put together. So cyclic right shift also gives you another code word is called a cyclic code. Okay. So this makes the code cyclic. Remember, this will not happen if n is not equal to order of beta. Okay, if order of beta is strictly greater than n, you have a gap. Okay, so you can't do that. Okay. Right, so only when n equals order of beta, I can do this. Is it okay? So this leads us to this idea of cyclic codes. Okay, so so these BCH codes are the special cases of cyclic codes. So, so in fact, if suppose order of beta is greater than n, let me show you what happens if an order of beta is greater than n. Okay. Suppose if order of beta is strictly greater than n. Okay. So what you should do is you should define a BCH code code with length equals equals order of beta. Okay, why stop at that? Okay. So you define a BCH code with length equals order of beta. That code will be cyclic. And then how do you go from that code to this guy? How can I go to this BCH code from that code? You shorten it. Okay, so you have to set some of those things to zero. Okay. You cannot puncture. Puncturing is different from shortening, right? Puncturing will drop the bits. Here you cannot drop it, you have to set those bits to zero. Only then the parity set matrix will drop out. So it will, it will become the shorter one. Okay. So you can shorten it. Okay, to go to that. Okay. So, so all BCH codes are shortened versions of cyclic codes. Okay. So, cyclic codes are more, in a way, more fundamental than the BCH code structure that we are looking at. Okay. So, so you might say I can say cyclic, but it's very common to say cyclic. Everybody says cyclic, so I'm also saying cyclic. Okay. If you want, you can call it cyclic. Okay. So, currently, I'm told in English the right way to pronounce, for instance, bicycle is to say bicycle. Okay. Because apparently, maybe maybe it's a lesson. In pronunciation, but we we'll say, we'll say cyclic just to keep it uh, common with all other common. Is it clear? So it makes sense to look at cyclic codes fundamentally. Okay, so what codes can be cyclic? Okay, so what is the definition of cyclic codes? Okay. Linear codes uh, closed under cyclic right. So what do I mean by closed under? So this right shift can also be replaced by left. So both of them are equivalent. Okay. Closed under means I have a code, I do an operation, I don't leave the code. So if that is the thing, then that, that operation is said to be closed under that. that uh, I mean, this, that code is said to be closed under that operation. Okay. So here the code is closed under cyclic so right. Okay. So such codes are interesting fundamentally from various reasons. They have a very nice rich algebraic structure and interestingly BCH codes are special cases of it, a shortened versions of it in general. Okay. So maybe we should look at it. So we will we'll see it real quick uh, in a couple of classes. It is not too crucial like we saw I mean the cyclic property was not really used anywhere. Right? We never used it. We only, we only used one property which, which also is true for the cyclic one. We used this notion of a generator polynomial. Right? 
So that is quite uh, that's that's that will come from the cyclic code in a very nice way. Okay. So that's a very nice uh, characterization. Except for that, nothing else uh, we used. Okay. All right. So so let's see some theory. The first uh, thing is we need a nice mathematical notation for or conceptual understanding of the cyclic right shift, right shift operation. Okay. So cyclic right shift, we know what it is, but how you describe it in algebraic structure? Okay, so this is the way to do it. We have to first define some ring which I, which I will call R n. Ring R n is basically. Okay, so we'll only do binary. Okay, so we'll only do binary. So before I do that, we'll only do binary cyclic codes. So for binary cyclic codes, we will usually set n to be odd. Okay, so just just fix these things. We are only dealing with binary codes and n odd. Okay. So this ring R n is basically polynomials uh, of degree less than or equal to n minus one with binary coefficients. Okay. Okay. So this is the ring R n. Okay. Addition is trivial, right? Addition is very very trivial. If you add two polynomials, you get another polynomial in the ring. I have to define multiplication. Okay. Why should I define multiplication? If I do regular polynomial multiplication, what can happen? Can this be a ring? No, I mean you will go outside of this set, right? So you take two polynomials of degree n minus one, you multiply, you get a polynomial of degree x bar two n minus one. I mean, there's no way that is going to be in this set. So what we will do is multiplication is done modulo x bar n minus one. Okay. All right. So I could have picked any other polynomial of degree n. I will pick this x bar n minus one. Well, minus one is the same as plus one. Okay, so I'll say x bar n plus one. When I'm dealing with just binary stuff, everything is GF two. So I'll say I will do multiplication modulo x bar n plus one. Okay, the reason why I'm saying that is if somebody tells me that I have uh, c of x, which is c zero plus c one x plus so on to c n minus one x bar n minus one, it turns out this definitely belongs to R n, right? No problem. If I multiply c of x by something in R n, I will get a cyclic right shift. Okay, what is that thing I should multiply by? By x. So if I multiply by x, so x times c of x equals what? C n minus one plus c zero x plus c one x squared all the way down to c n minus two x bar n minus two. In x bar n minus one. I'm sorry. In okay. so in this ring that I have, multiplication by x nicely captures cyclic right shift operation. So if I, what what do we do for multiplication for cyclic right shift by two positions? X square x bar three. Okay, I can even multiply by x inverse if I like. As long as I define x inverse suitably, I can do it. Okay, I can do a left shift. Okay, what will be that? Only x bar n minus one. Okay, I can define. So in the ring, x bar n is equal to one. So x bar x, x inverse is the same as x bar n minus one. I can define that. that okay, so I can do shifting very nicely in this ring. Okay, so that's the first. Thing, okay, so we will interpret lean cyclic codes. Okay, Le cyclic codes are linear codes. Codes are also subsets of this ring. Right. So codes. So this ring is also a vector space. Okay, so I can also think of the codes as a subspace of this ring. Okay, now the loose terminology, mixed up terminology. The a cyclic code. If I define a cyclic code of length n, somebody gives me a cyclic code of length n. Every code word of that cyclic code belongs to R. Okay, right? so I can think of my entire code cyclic code as coming from R. Okay, it, it comes from R. So every code word comes from R. Right? Okay. So using this ring, I'm going to I'm going to study study the cyclic codes. Okay, so I will not use too many properties of this ring. I'm just defining it for completeness. Then we will see what to do later. Okay. So now the next thing that is defined. Okay. So 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 let's go back. So vector spaces we had subspaces. For groups we had subgroups. For rings there is something called an ideal. Okay. So that is what is contained in a ring, and it obeys the properties of the ring. That's called an ideal. Okay. So subspace we define for vector spaces. That's why we define the linear code. We had a vector space. We define a subspace for it. Okay. And for group we had a subgroup. Subgroup and subspaces satisfy only the vector space property. Subgroup you have only one operation. In the ring you have two operations. Okay, so if you have a, you can have a sub ring, but that's not so interesting. An ideal is much more interesting. So what's an ideal? Let me define an ideal of a ring. If 
I'll, I'll define it with respect to R and S. I have to strictly define it with lots of, lots of intricacies here. So let's just define ideal of R and okay. A subset of R and okay, is an ideal if for uh, there are two conditions that need to be satisfied. So let me write it down both. Uh, let me write down both of them. The first condition would be very easy for you to see. If you have a of x, b of x in i, then a of x plus b of x should also be in i. Okay, that's a very simple condition. It's a slow standard addition. So it's, it's like a subgroup of R, of the additive group. If you view R n as an additive group. It's a subgroup. If you do R and S the vector space, it's a subspace. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second property is if you have an A of X in I and the B of X in R and okay, so remember that. So I have an A of X in I, have a B of X in R and then B of X times A of X should actually belong to R. So this sounds like a very, very strong requirement. Okay, so I'll motivate this a little bit later. This is this is what's needed. Is that okay? It's a bit strong. You might first time you look at it, maybe I made a mistake or something. You might say, but no, this is correct. Okay, so if a of x belongs to the ideal, and b of x is any other polynomial from the entire ring, if I multiply b of x with a of x, that should I go to? Should come back to the ideal. Okay, should not go. Okay. So for instance, the integer ring is something that you are very common with. Right? So if I take all the multiples of say three, okay, so if I look at the sub subgroup of the integers. Which consists of all the multiples of three that will form an ideal. Okay, because if I add any two multiple of three, I get a multiple of three. If I take any other integer and multiply it by a multiple of three, what do I get? I get another multiple of three. Okay, so in a way, these ideals are multiples of in ideals and integers are multiples of a number. Okay, there is an interesting converse to this statement. If, you, if somebody tells you that there is an abstract ideal for an integer, you can show that there is a number such that that ideal equals all multiples of that number. Okay, there are no other ideals other than multiples of numbers in integers. Okay, so so it's a very intriguing aspect. There is a very similar statement which is true for R and also. Okay, so that's what we will prove. Okay. So before that, let me just unpack this for you. So what is b of x times a of x belonging to I? Remember, b of x is some arbitrary polynomial from R and. What form does it have? B zero plus B one x plus B two x bar, so on till B n minus one x bar n minus one. Okay. So if somebody tells me that I is an ideal, clearly that implies for a of x in I, okay, x times a of x will be what? What? X times a of x will be an I. That's no problem. X bar times a of x will also be an I. So any power of x times I, a of x, is also an I. Okay. So instead of requiring that b of x times a of x is an i for every R n, what can I simply require? X times a of x is an i. That's enough. Okay. Right? If x times a of x is an i, what will happen? X square times so so that's enough. Okay. So that's what I'm trying to say. So even this other i we don't need. Okay. If I just require x times a of x is an i for every a of x, that in fact implies this condition. Why is that? You take an arbitrary b of x and multiply by a of x. What do you get? You will get an x times a of x here, which is in the ideal. You will get a of x here. Then you take x times a of x and multiply by x again. You will get x square times a of x, which is again an i. Like this, all of these bases are in i. And then you multiply by these scalars and add them up. What will happen? You will never leave i. Okay. So okay. So maybe I should be careful here since I am in binary. This is all good enough. So if I'm not binary, I have to add some scalars here and say, okay, is it okay? So the second requirement in R n can be replaced by just this requirement. Okay, if I have a of x in I, x times a of x belongs to I. I introduce cyclic codes. Now, what's the connection between binary, linear, cyclic codes, and ideals of R n? They are one and the same. Okay, so once you see this, we can easily see that. Binary linear cyclic codes or binary cyclic codes are ideals of. Okay, so this is the first and interesting 
result as far as cyclic codes are concerned. So once you understand ideals of Rn, you have understood all possible binary cyclic codes. Okay, there can be no other binary cyclic code other than okay. So how do you think of ideals of Rn? Okay, so it turns out, like I said, the crucial thing is this idea of multiples. Okay. So in fact, in Rn also that is true. Suppose I take so, so here's an example of an ideal. Okay, example of ideal. Suppose I take some G of X on R. Okay, and then I can generate an ideal with it. How do I generate an ideal with it? Define I to be set of all multiples of G of X. Okay, so you take all possible O of X times G of X. Then O of X is in R. Okay, this will be an ideal. Okay, how do I show that this is an ideal? Okay, so you fix some G of X and then you do this, this will be an idea. How do you show that this is an idea? Now you take any two, sum, sum, sum it up, you will again get an element in the ideal. You take A of X and G of X multiply by some other polynomial in Rn, you will again get an element of this idea. Okay, because all possible multiples have been included. Okay? Multiplication is associated with power. You can use all the simple properties and see that this will be an idea. Okay? It turns out, again, interestingly, a converse kind of statement is true for such a statement. Every ideal in Rn looks like this. So for every ideal in Rn, if somebody comes up with an abstract ideal in Rn, somebody gives you an ideal in Rn, you can ask him to provide a G of X or you can compute a G of X such that the ideal will be equal to this one. Okay. So these, these kind of ideals have a name, these are called principal ideals. Okay, the reason is they are element, uh, they are generated by a single element, single element from Rn generates the entire ideal. Such ideals are called principal ideals. The statement that is true for Rn is every ideal in Rn is principal. Okay, so similar statement is true for the integers. Every ideal in the integers is principal ideal. It is just one way it generates the whole thing. Likewise, Rn is also what's called a principal ideal domain. So it has every ideal being principal. Okay, so that's the first thing we'll prove. Okay. Okay, so that's what's the first thing we're going to do. Okay, so so let's let's try to prove that statement. So here's the here's the result. Okay, suppose you have a cyclic code C. Okay, somebody gives you a cyclic code at length n. Okay, remember n is going to be odd. C is a binary code. All that we'll assume. Okay, all that we'll assume. Okay, so clearly this is an ideal of R n. So that we know. So instead of calling ideal of Rn, I am going to say cyclic code. Both of them are equal, nothing good. The first result is there exists. Okay, so let me go step by step. The first uh, result that I want is let G of X be B B B B B B B B B non-zero polynomial non-zero element of okay, so let me just say non-zero right, let me polynomial polynomial in C with minimal degree okay. Is that okay so zero polynomial really doesn't have a degree okay so I don't have to say non-zero polynomial once I say the polynomial has a degree it is non-zero okay so anyway, so suppose I say G of X is a polynomial in C in my cyclic code with minimal degree. The degree is minimal. Okay, then G of X is unique. Okay, it's very easy to prove it. Okay, so how do you prove this? If I say the non-zero polynomial in in the cyclic code with minimal degree has to be unique. Why is that? How do you prove it? Yeah, if there are two of them, you subtract the two, again you are in the cyclic code, but that will have a degree strictly lesser than either of them, so it cannot be. Okay, so it's a very easy proof. Proof is very simple. The next statement is C itself. So, so, so there's a notation here for such principal ideals, these are denoted G of X like this. Okay, so what do I mean by this? This key, this key is denoted as the ideal generated by G of X. It's just a shorthand notation to denote principal ideas. Okay, so it turns out C equals G of X. Okay, okay. 
fine. So how do you prove this? How can I prove this? Any ideas for proving it? Yeah. So what do you use the division algebra? Okay. So you take let c of x belong to c. Okay. Then you divide c of x by c of x. Okay. Where? Where will you divide this? So you don't divide in Rn. Okay. Rn is a crazy thing to divide in. So you have to divide it, divide this in g of two x. Okay. So this is the regular regular division. Okay. Then we will get a portion and a remainder. Okay. So now if I do, if I push this to this side, what will happen? I get C of x which belongs to C and then I get a C of x plus G of x. What does this belong to? If I do say modulo x minus 1, if I, minus 1 which I don't have to do because C of x has degree less than or equal to n minus 1, right? So if I divide by G of x which also has degree less than or equal to n minus 1, I will not exceed degrees in any way. Okay, so this will be fine. Both of these case belong to C. Why does this also belong to C? G of x belongs to C. Any multiple of G of x also belongs to C. Where both of them belong to C. So what about the sum? That will also belong to C. Okay. Now I know degree of R of x is what? Strictly less than degree of G of x. And this will not give a contradiction only if R of x is equal to 0. Okay, so this why? Because degree of GFX is minimal, right? You see that? Okay. See, I have a now. So suppose RFX is not zero. What will happen? RFX has degree strictly less than the degree of GFX, and RFX also belongs to C. Okay. So that's a contradiction of the minimality of the degree of GFX. So that implies RFX is zero. Okay. So every CFX in C has to be a multiple of GFX. Okay, so there are various other ways of showing it. This is how you think it shows. Is that okay? So think about that. So, I mean, I mean, I'll take just two more minutes and give you the last property, which is again interesting. The third property is G of X provides X bar n minus 1 in G of 2 X. So, this polynomial that we have, which was my polynomial of minimal degree, minimal degree in my cyclic code, okay, not only generates my cyclic code, it also has to divide x bar n plus 1. How will you prove it? Whenever something has to divide it, you always use the remainder, I mean division algorithm. You take x bar n minus 1 divided by g of x, okay. You will get q of x times g of x plus r of x. Degree of r of x is strictly less than degree of g of x. Now you do modulo x bar n plus 1. What will happen? x bar n plus 1 will go away. So you see that q of x times g of x belongs in the ideal, belongs to the cyclic code, okay, and it is equal to r of x, and r of x is degree strictly less than what, what, what g of x is supposed to be, that is a contradiction. So that cannot happen, so r of x is to be zero. Okay. So this polynomial of minimal degree in a cyclic code is a powerful polynomial. Once you get a handle on it, you know everything about the cyclic code. Okay. So that polynomial is called the generator polynomial of the cyclic code. Okay. Alright, so the generator polynomial for the BCH code that we had is also the generator polynomial of the cyclic BCH code when n equals order of beta. If n is lesser than order of beta, then you have to go to that cyclic code which is the full cyclic code. For that, it will be the generator polynomial. Okay, so that is the connection. Okay. So BCH codes are usually defined only when n equals order of beta. So people will not define BCH codes for n less than order of beta. If you want n less than order of beta, you have to shorten it. But I think they're just saying BCH code loosely for it. But it's okay. Hopefully it's clear. Okay, so we'll stop here for today. If the people who want to do projects uh, have some time now, we can have a quick chat.